September 2010. Tyler Clementi, a young college freshman from Rutgers University in the United States, had been secretly webcammed by his roommate when he was intimate with another man. When the online world learned of the incident, the ridicule and cyberbullying ignited. A few days later, submerged in shame and humiliation, Tyler jumped from the George Washington Bridge to his death. He was 18. May 18, 2016, back home in Singapore, an 11-year-old Singaporean student failed his exams. To please his parents, the boy wove a fictitious account of his grades. But on the day he was to show his parents his mid-year examination results, the primary five student locked himself in his bedroom. Shortly after, when his parents realized the door was locked, they opened it with a spare key and found him missing. Overwhelmed with guilt, he jumped 17 floors from his bedroom window. Everybody feels shame. We can experience fleeting shame by farting loudly in an elevator, or we can experience lasting shame as a person by constantly feeling flawed and inferior. Even at a young age as a toddler, we feel ashamed as we accidentally peed our pants. In fact, we can feel different intensities of shame. The most is humiliation. In a brain research study published in 2014, humiliation is proved to be a more intensely felt emotion than either happiness or even anger. And humiliation can be so painful at times that we can think, this hurts so much, I wish I could just die. To make things worse, the omnipresence of social media today has created a new sort of culture, one that is awash in moral judgment. People are more guarded with their words, afraid that they might transgress one of the public norms that have been spoken into existence. Whether or not it is intentional, those being accused of incorrect or made a mistake face ruinous consequences. They have a big price to pay. What used to be a whisper of embarrassment known only to our family, school, or community has now turned into a loud echo of humiliation online. Literally, the whole world knows what's wrong with you. So when I had to do the article with Straits Times, it was yet another obstacle that I had to cross because you don't know who's reading the article, you don't know who's watching the video. I'm the youngest in my family. I have a brother and a sister. So during my growing up years, I was studying the whole time. But I think it was until like JC, I remember it was that time that I just started having this thought of uh, maybe one day, you know, I can, I can settle down, start a family and have kids. La. I think at that time, I thought I was quite a quite a good person, you know, like never really give my parents or my teachers any problem and you know, like did quite a lot of um, voluntary work as well. So I thought I was quite a good person in that sense. So I met him when, when we were in school. I think the relationship lasted around two and a half years. I thought the relationship was actually quite stable, like both of us wanted to settle down. We um, actually quite close to his parents and when we started work, we had stable jobs and, and all that. So it just felt like he's the guy that I wanted to marry. Like. I thought that the relationship was very stable, right? So then I... I mean, that gave me excuses to do things that, that weren't very pleasing to God. When we found out that I was pregnant, um, there was a lot of fear in his eyes. There was a lot of fear in me as well. I think one of the greatest fear was what if he decide to leave me? What if he choose to leave me and I end up being a single mother? Will I have the courage or the strength or the resources to bring up my child alone? Yeah. Another fear was, what would people think of me? What would my parents think of me? That was the fear that actually drove us to make the decision to go for an abortion. He suggested it and I decided to just go along with it. I think when I chose to go for an abortion, right, even though deep down I knew that it was wrong, I just felt at that time that it was a problem and I had to just quickly get rid of it. So 
I hardened my heart to do it. I think after after the abortion, everything just came. You know, what did I just do? I'm just wrecked with guilt, knowing that I had taken away my child because I always wanted to be a mother from young. So, like the thought of taking away my child when he's at his most vulnerable stage, when I'm supposed to be the one protecting him, and yet. I chose to take him away. I think that really, really wrecked me. And I think shame also came together with that, like knowing that I had done something so wrong. Because all along I thought that I've always been a good person, and suddenly I just saw myself as like the worst person on earth, and so that really broke me as well. Have you heard of the chocolate bar analogy? It's one of the most commonly used examples for sex education. To demonstrate the point, the instructor will take out a chocolate bar and refer it to a girl's sexuality. Then, the instructor will pick a female volunteer and tell her to share her sexuality with a few boys in the room by inviting them to take bites of her chocolate bar. So, the first few boys took bites, but soon, the chocolate bar was more and more disgusting, chewed up and filthy. The results? The remaining boys in the room wouldn't even want to take any more bites. While the chocolate bar analogy serves as a cautionary tale to illustrate what will happen to girls when they had sex too much or too early, it's gender biased and utilizes mainly shame and fear as deterrence. Worst of all, it offers no solution empathy or hope for girls who went through these experiences. In a separate Straits Times article titled Young and Pregnant, Two Abortions by the Age of 16, published on 18th March 2018, here are the top comments on the article. Let's not be mistaken, this is not a debate about premarital sex or having multiple sex partners. And just to be sure, this isn't even about pro-life or pro-choice, but the narrative here is this, how our society has been accustomed to shaming as deterrence in moral education and moral justice, resulting in many who feel too fearful and worthless to speak up. There are no permanent moral standards, just the shifting judgment of the crowd. It's as if public opinion can convict us guilty, or worse, deep down inside, we might have already given ourselves a death sentence. It is a culture of oversensitivity, overreaction, and frequent moral panics, during which everybody feels compelled to go along. Shame has become an unspoken epidemic, and this silence of fear is a hefty price for any individual to pay. I think after the abortion, what really struck me was I really didn't know that this abortion was going to wreck my life the way it did. Like I didn't know that the magnitude or the intensity of the grief and the pain would be so huge. And there was no one that I could share to. I also didn't really share very much with him. So like I was just keeping everything inside. And I think for him, he was also trying to manage his own um, emotions. I think initially we try to support each other more but I think subsequently because of the guilt and the pain and the emotions I think subsequently the relationship just broke down and we just decided to call it off. Yeah. I think at that time I felt there was a lot of shame. Like I couldn't even say the word abortion for many years. Or even when I hear the word abortion, like something inside me will cringe. 
I just couldn't even tell a single person. I also don't know how people are able to help, you know, at that time. After the abortion, I started crying every single day. Like, I couldn't control it. There was just, the pain was just so intense that I just cried every single night. And I think that lasted for one and a half years. And I think I got to a point where I was so tired and yet I couldn't control myself. Like, so during the daytime, I was hiding it very well. Like, I was just working the whole time and then I was just like going out for drinks at night and going home really late. But every time I just, when, every time I go to bed, right, I just find myself crying every single night. And I think I got to a point when I was so tired, you know, like, I remember telling God one day, God, uh, I don't even ask to be happy already, you know, like, I just don't want tears to be on my eyes anymore. So that was how tired and how weary I was. Yet also at the same time, I was angry at God. You know, I ran away from God, I refused to go to church. I just kept blaming Him, like, God, why do you let this happen to me, you know? I was angry. I was angry at a lot of things. I also didn't really know exactly what I was angry at. Yeah, I think at that time I wanted to die every day. I'm like, God, uh, why don't you just take me away? Like, I cannot live anymore. I just don't know how to live anymore. Like, it was just dark. Like, everything was just dark. I felt very hopeless. I felt like there's no meaning in life anymore. I just felt everything just came crashing down and even seeing like my own character like just how bad I am a person everything just came cr crushing down and I just felt there's really no point anymore so during that time even though I ran away from God and I didn't go to church I remember there were many times that I felt very condemned. I felt like I was the worst sinner, right? But yet, during those nights, the passage in John chapter 8 just kept coming to me about the, adult, the, the woman caught in adultery, right? So like this part where the Lord Jesus asked her, Has anyone condemned you? And she said, No, no one, sir. Then Jesus said, go now and live your life of sin. So that just kept coming back to me, telling me that I'm not condemned. Like Jesus, he, he didn't condemn me and he doesn't condemn me at all. And I think that really saved my life. I came to realize that time doesn't heal. Because yeah. if it does, then you will have gotten better. But I wasn't getting any better and I was just stuck in this darkness, you know, in this dark pit and I just couldn't get out of it. And I think that was the day that I realized that I really needed to seek help. The first thing that I did was to text a friend and told her to pray for me. I didn't really tell her exactly what happened, I just said that I need help, like just pray for me. Yeah, and I think that was what she did. And I don't know, I, I was just very convicted that I, I made a mistake like that because I didn't know God, I didn't know His Word, I just wasn't close to Him at all. I was just very convicted that no one can help me, you know, only God can help me. That was the only thing that I felt like I must go back to God, like, that was my thought at that time. So I started looking for a church. After the abortion, I found it very difficult to trust people. It's this very huge wall you know, between me and people. So even after I came back to church and my, my life group people and all that, I didn't see any one of them as my friends actually at that time. Like, I just thought like, okay, these people are just my LG mates, you know, they're just my life group mates. And, and you cannot come any closer to me. Like the moment you come this close, right, I just shut off, like shut you off from my life. I mean, all along I thought that this abortion thing that I did it's just gonna stay with me as a secret for the rest of my life like I don't have to tell anyone life can get on you know. um, but I realized it's not the case one day when David Lim came to our church 
and he shared. Now let me give you a phrase that's so important related to this. He said, if you have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove, that's when you'll walk into your destiny. I had no idea what exactly he was talking about, but all I knew that there was something burning inside me that tell me that I must walk into my destiny. Like there was just, just this burning desire, you know, like I don't care what I need to do, I just want to walk into my destiny. When it comes to nothing to lose, I felt I lost everything. Like there was nothing more that I could lose. And there was nothing more that I could prove to anyone. I just felt like I was the worst person on earth, right? Like there's nothing more, there's nothing to prove at all. But when it comes to something to hide, I just, nothing to hide, I felt, yeah, you know, I have this thing that I've been hiding and have not been able to tell anyone. But I think it was that thing that Pastor David Lim said, right, that really made me want to tell someone. In John Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, the main character Christian gets on a journey of adventures but eventually finds himself lost in his destiny. Instead, he finds himself locked in a castle of doubts, full of despair. When he finally remembers the priceless key in his pocket, he escapes and finds his way back on to the right path. Afterward, he makes a point to go back to where he got off track and posts a sign to warn others. We went off the path and discovered what it meant to walk on forbidden ground. Let those who come after be careful. In case carelessness makes them suffer our fate, to end up prisoners for trespassing of the ones who called despair, whose castle is doubting. Christian understood the depths of doubt and despair that attend our regretful choices. He also understood the tender mercies that came from above the forgiveness he received for his misdeeds. He wanted to use them to help others. So I decided to share it on my birthday some years back. I remember I wrote a script because it was just so difficult to share. And you know when you get emotional, you get very incoherent. So I actually wrote down exactly what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. And so I rehearsed, you know, a few times at home. I decided to share it with my very, very close friends and with my life group. Yeah, so I just share. It felt very raw. Like It felt like I was reliving every single moment again. And it was just very, very painful. But I was just so determined to do it. You know, I don't care what I was going through. I just must do it because I just wanted to walk into my destiny right at that time. I think after one or two years after coming back to church, I felt I was ready to get professional help. Like I felt I was ready to unpack everything that was inside of me, you know, and find help. So that's when um, I went to Rachel's Vineyard. So it's this post-abortion recovery three-day retreat. And I think it was during that retreat that changed me. That really gave me a lot of healing. Because actually, all along, deep down, I've just always been asking God, God, where's my child? So at the retreat, something inside me changed. Like, I know that my child is safe. And in that, I felt I could let him go. Yeah. So that was a very um, big healing in my life. And after that, the counsellor told us to ask God, What's the purpose of my unborn child's life? It was then in the room, he told me exact words. He said, go, use your unborn child's life to propel the gospel forward. And at the time, I felt, okay, yes, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do. I just knew that I need to use my unborn child's life to propel the gospel forward. I mean, shortly after the retreat, um, I felt it was time to leave my job. I had no idea what exactly I wanted to do. All I knew was I wanted to do something related to abortion. And when I was traveling in New Zealand, I came across Buttons Project. And um, when I first heard about Buttons Project, it resonated so much inside me 
and I really I just thought if only at that time when I was going through my struggles if only Button's project was around I would have been very much helped and comforted in knowing that I'm not alone. So Button's project in New Zealand, what they did was they started collecting physical buttons to commemorate the babies that they have not met because of abortion. So when I saw from the website like wow there are just so many buttons and that came with so many you know messages. I think it was the first time in my life that I felt hey I'm not alone in in going through this pain and this grief and there are many more out there doing the going through the same thing. Also abortion happened very quickly, right? Like from the time you found out that you're pregnant to the time you go for abortion. It's just a span of say one, one, one and a half to two weeks. So it's always like very surreal, like did it even happen? And it's just left hanging there, you know, and um, sometimes you're just in denial, like I, don't know, like I think it didn't happen, I don't think it happened, you know. Um, but to give people an avenue to send in a button or something tangible to like a form of memorial for the baby, I felt it could help a lot of people and it could help it could have helped me a lot at that time. So I met up with um, the founders. I met up with the couple who started the project because they themselves had abortion before and they dis they also went through the same pain and they wanted to help others. So they started collecting buttons and creating like memorials for these babies. So after I met them, I saw like at her house, I saw 20 over thousand buttons in like a few jars. Well, and I, I think at that time it really hit me, you know, like it's no longer just a statistics. Like every time we see, oh, stat abortion stats, like it's just a number. But when you see so many buttons, right, it just struck me that every, behind every single number is a baby lost. Behind every single number is a father and a mother wrecked with guilt and going through pain and I don't even know where these people are. And I think it's the same in Singapore, like where are all these men and all these women who are suffering in silence alone and where are they like are they crying out for help and and are they able to find help i think that was what something that really really resonated in me so i decided to bring buttons project back in, uh, into singapore the most difficult part of starting buttons project was having to tell my parents and my family about the abortion because when it happened i Nobody knew, right? Only the guy and I, we knew about it. So I had to tell my family before I launched the project. Like, I wouldn't want my parents to find out about the abortion through other people. So I had to tell them myself. And the thought that just kept coming to me was, ha, ah, what if they kill me? How? <laughs> you know? But uh, I think it was a lot in my own mind, a lot of fear in my own mind, because when I told them about the abortion, all I could see was, apart from shock, all I could see was pain in their eyes. Like, their own daughter actually went through so much pain and they weren't there to walk with me. I think there was a lot of pain in them and I think at that time, I came to realize that no matter how much wrong, how many wrong things I've done, I can always go back to them because they love me and they will still accept me for who I am, for even the wrong things that I've done. And I think all they wanted was to walk together with me, to journey together with me. On the other hand, I also wanted to help uh, people who are broken because of abortion to find healing and restoration. So, we started a support group. There's a team of us. Um, all of us have been through abortion. All of us have found healing, have been through a long healing process. So now, our support group, we meet on a monthly basis. And um, these girls just come to us and join us for our, our activities. Um, 
just to know that they are not alone. You know, just to be in a knowing that they are in a group of girls who have all been through the same experience. They they don't feel alone. They don't feel judged. They don't feel condemned. And by seeing, letting the girls see how far we have come, you know, in our healing journey, it actually gives them hope to believe that one day they can be healed as well. They can find hope as well. How many of you honestly, when you're thinking about doing something vulnerable or saying something vulnerable, think, man, vulnerability is a weakness. I would never let anyone know my weakness. And precisely, it is because of this myth that vulnerable is weak. Coupled with fear of judgment, our shame grows in an endless spiral of secrecy and silence. Vulnerability is in fact pure courage the true measurement of courage for both men and women. To be vulnerable is to let ourselves be seen and to be honest, nothing to hide. But first, we need to talk about shame. For many of the girls that I've encountered, a lot of times, the thing that's stopping them from sharing about their abortion was shame. Like they just couldn't tell, they just couldn't even Safe, you know, and of course, plus it was so painful to tell someone. It's just too painful to relieve that incident, so it just stopped them from sharing, even to their parents or even to their close friends. And they just don't know who to find. They don't know who to talk to. I think one thing that stopped me from seeking help was shame. Like there was so much shame, like it was eating me up inside, and I felt I couldn't tell anyone. But I realized that after I started sharing and after I started coming out of this shame and started telling people about what I went through, and I think that's when help came. Right? Like people started praying for me and that's when I felt uh, comfortable to seek professional help and that's when I could find healing. I think for people who are struggling with shame, like thinking that they have done something wrong and they couldn't tell anyone for the fear of judgment, encourage them to find someone who is mature, someone who, whom they can trust, to share their struggles just so that they can find help and find healing. As we end this narrative, it's tempting to remain standing on the sideline and have two different kinds of responses. One is to watch with admiration and cheer fervently for those who share so daringly of their shame, that Me Too moment when you feel so encouraged and hope that maybe one day you are able to break the silence. Perhaps not to the entire world, but by just coming out of the dark is a huge step for you. Two is to remain as a critic or to remain indifferent to the narrative. The not me response or the this would not happen to me response. But like we said earlier, no one is able to remain bulletproof. We can get numb to these stories or the human lives behind it, but we will never know when it's our turn to have something to hide. Yet the funny truth is that, like Christian in the story, at some point in life, we all find ourselves locked in the castle of doubt and despair. While trying hard to prove that we have nothing to hide, we are chained by our guilt and shame. The only way out? That priceless key, hidden and forgotten in your pocket.